Hello, everybody. This is Paul Neeson with Torah Life Ministries, and I am going to be reading Leviticus 7 this morning, continuing to read the Bible live every single day. Now, during the week, I usually get on about 5, 5.30 in the morning, and the weekends, I usually get on at 10 o'clock, but today I, I realized I got something to do later, so I had to get on this early, and I apologize to those of you that usually join us live at the normal time, but uh, here we are right now. We're on, and uh, and we're going to be reading Leviticus chapter 7. So if you, you normally watch a live feed and you have to watch a replay today, forgive me for that. Uh, but we got a lot to cover here today. So for those of you that are joining me live, thank you. And on the replay, uh, thank you for you as well. So I'm going to read uh, the Shema first, Deuteronomy 6, 4, and 9. Shema Yisrael, Yahweh Eloheinu, Yahweh Echad. Baruch Shem Kavo Mahutov Leolam Vaed. Hear, O Israel, Yahweh is our Elohim, Yahweh is one. Blessed is the name of his glorious kingdom for all eternity. Hallelujah, hallelujah. So we are reading Leviticus 7. Uh, we got a good amount of stuff to cover here in Leviticus 7, so we're going to get started uh, right now with, uh, with this uh, chapter. And uh, we're going to start off right here in uh, verse uh, verse 1. It says, These are the instructions for the guilt offering. It is most holy. So uh, right there, uh, we have a, a very important scripture here. It says, These are the instructions which Yahweh provides. The instructions, you can call them commandments, but don't call them laws. Uh, these are the instructions of our Creator. And uh, it says, it is most holy, most set apart. We're, called, we're reading about the guilt offering now. We already read about the, the sin offering. Now this is instructions for the guilt offering, All right? So it says uh, uh, the animal sacrificed as a guilt offering must be slaughtered in a place where the burnt offerings are slaughtered and his blood must be splattered against all sides of the altar. The priest will then offer all of its fat on the altar, including the fat of the a broad tail, the fat around the internal organs, the two kidneys, and the fat around the near, the loins, and the lo long lobe of the liver. These are to be removed with the kidneys, and the priest will burn them on the altar as a special gift presented to Yahweh. This is a guilt offering. So, so now, so that. It's, it's explaining about this uh, guilt offering, and and, and there's, there's going to be stuff to cover here about this when we get some later chapters. But uh, to start off with for now, it says uh, in verse 2, where it says, uh, In the place where they kill, there's a burnt offering. It says, uh, the word translated burnt is, is, is diha, which means to go up. Referring to smoke, uh, the sweet savior. So it's a smoke that's going up, the sweet savior smoke. And in verse six, it says the meat is eaten and it is all burned, is listed in verses in, in, in verses two and three. So we discuss that, and then it goes on. Uh, we'll, we'll continue reading here. It says, uh, any male from a priest family may eat the meat. It must be e eaten in a sacred place for it is most holy. So everything about this offering was set apart, different. That's what holy means. It means different. It means set apart, different in some way than the other offerings. And, and, and it has to be by somebody who was set apart, by the priest. And we're going to read here some more of the notes here. So it says, uh, the same instructions apply towards both the guilt offering and the sin offering. Both belong to the priest who used them to purify someone making that person right with Yahweh, making that person right with Yahweh. And who do you know that does that today? Who do you know that uh, uh, purifies someone, uh, making that person right with Yahweh? So, so think about this, and this is the first time we see this offering right here, besides saying it's being set apart, but we see here, uh, it's to purify somebody, making that person right with Yahweh. And that is... A Messiah himself, Yeshua, and that's what he does. He's making us right with our wonderful creator uh, and because he makes us pure, so he makes us right with him. It says, in the case of the burnt offering, 
the priest may keep the hide of the sacred animal. Any grain offering that has been baked in an oven, prepared in a pan, or cooked in a griddle belongs to the priest who presents it. All other grain offerings, whether made of dry flour or flour uh, moistened with olive oil, are to be shared equally among the priest, uh, the descendants of Aaron. So now we're going to get into the further, further instructions of the peace offering. But as we see the guilt offering, so we got a guilt offering and a peace offering. So one is given our guilt or, or, or made to uh, redeem our guilt, uh, which is similar to a sin offering. And then we have the peace offering to bring us that peace with this situation. And again, a lot of people will look overlook these offerings uh, and, and skip over them or not understand them or not get them. But they all point to Yeshua, our Messiah. And that is the key to understand. And it's a beautiful thing of scripture. And some as people say, well, now we have him, so we don't need these, all these instructions. No, our creator gave us all the instructions for a reason. And uh, and he gave us these instructions here to know these different things. And each offering uh, is part of one of the aspects of what Yeshua did for us or who Yeshua is. And now we're looking at the peace, uh, further instructions for the peace offering. And Yeshua is known as our best Sar Shalom, the Prince of Peace. And that's what he does within us. That's what he gives us with his Rahadak Kodesh. We can be at peace, even though we're guilty sinners. We're all guilty sinners, every single one of us. But, uh, but if we understand these offerings and the offerings of Yeshua, we could be at peace. But we have to have a repentant heart like we read last time. So it says uh, uh, in, in verse 11, we're going to read. Well, verse 11 to 17, verses 11 to 18, it says, The peace offering was divided into three kinds according to purpose. Thanksgiving offerings, vow offering, and voluntary offering. A thanksgiving offering was appropriate whenever one wished to show thanks to Yahweh, as when receiving from a serious, uh, as from recovering from a serious illness, uh, surviving a dangerous calamity, or, or a vow offering was given in fulfillment of a vow, and a voluntary offering, uh, however needed to uh, to for a special occasion or no reason. So these were these three different types of offerings that we're going to be covering here, here today. And then in this uh, translation, it says, the priest lift the heave during the, the, towards heaven. That moves up and down. The heave offering that belongs to the priest. So we're going to see more about this as well. So let's read verse 11. It says, these are the instructions regarding the different kinds of peace offerings that may be presented to Yahweh. So we have different kinds of peace offerings. So within each offering, there's different kinds of offering, which is another exciting, beautiful thing. <laughs> and it's not just a one type of offering and you're done and done with. You got different ways you can make these offerings. You got different animals you can bring for these offerings and then different types or reasons for these offerings that we're going to be covering right now. So verse 12, if you present your peace offering as an expression of thanksgiving, so that's one of the ways to make peace as your expression of thanks. And that's what and we need to offer to Yeshua always consistently our thanks or for Yahweh giving us Yeshua and for his blood. The usual animal sacrifice must be accompanied uh, by various kinds of bread uh, made without yeast. <laughs> These uh, cakes made with olive oil, water wafers spread with oil and cakes made of choice flour mixed with olive oil. These peace offerings of thanksgiving must also be accompanied by loaves of bread made with yeast. So we have the without yeast and now with yeast. And it says uh, one of the, each of the breads must be presented as a gift to Yahweh. It will then belong to the priest uh, that splatters blood on the peace offering against the altar. Uh, and says the meat of the peace offering or thanksgiving must be eaten on the same day as it's offered. None of it may be saved for the next morning. Now let's look at this offering of bread here for a moment and where it talks about uh, the leaven that's in one and not in the other. See, when we come to him, uh, we, ha we have a, a mission of guilt and there's sin tied to that. And, and then the altar in a perfect that, that perfect sacrifice, we need to come pure without leaven, without the sin. But then we see here, uh, he's saying, now in this part of the peace offering, you come to him for bread with leaven, with sin. And what that could represent in our lives is understanding that 
no matter how much we try to purify, purify ourselves, we need, we're never going to be completely pure. And uh, so, so there's always going to be some type of sin in our life because we are sinners. And if you can't admit you're a sinner, uh, you, don't, uh, you don't have a savior. Yeshua is here for those that, that, that not know the uh, righteous, as it says. It says those that know they're sinners. That's who he came for. And he came the first time for sinners, and he's coming back for the righteous ones the second time around, the ones that want to follow him. Uh, but it, but but this is what it's about, saying we're not perfect. So you make this, this offering, this peace offering, this Thanksgiving offering with leaven in it, actually. So uh, then uh, verse 18 says, uh, If you bring an offering to fulfill a vow or a voluntarily offering, the meat must be eaten on the same day. The sacrifice is offered. But whatever is left over may be eaten on the second day. You see this, uh, the, the priest handbook of what they're going through. Uh, there was a lot to it, uh, and uh, or but then again, there wasn't a lot to it. So uh, <laughs> they had an opportunity uh, on, on many occasions to make these offerings. And again, we're all guilty before him. None of us are perfect, but that's not an excuse uh, to, continue, to continue living in sin. But uh, this Thanksgiving offering, knowing that we're not perfect, that he still gave us Yeshua's for us. Hallelujah for that. And uh, as we continue here to see this, uh, in verse 16, we'll go to verse 17 here. We're, we're up to verse 16, but we're about to see here something really amazing in verse 18 and how it represents Yeshua in our life. Uh, so by verse 14, we, we saw the heave offering. And now uh, when we get to 18, this is for intentional sin, sin that was done on purpose. Uh, so let's go to 17 here. Any meat left over until the third day must be completely burned up. So the first part of the offering, all the meat had to be consumed completely or burned on the first day. But the second part, the Thanksgiving offering, the meat could last to the second day. But regardless, all the meat needed to be done by the third day. But now 18, and this is significant, and I'm going to highlight this one because this might just be our, our scripture of the day. It says, if any of the meat uh, from the peace offering day, well, it says here in verse 18, if any of the meat from the peace offering is eaten on the third day, the person who presented it will no longer be accepted by Yahweh. You will receive no credit for offering it. By then, the meat will be contaminated. If you eat it, you will be punished for your sin. And uh, the note here says, this is a sim and this is in the Hebraic root scriptures. It says this is a symbolic of Messiah's sacrifice, in which he was resurrected on a third day, and with his resurrection, no animal sacrifice according to the Levitical law was necessary any longer or acceptable to Yahweh. So once this sacrifice was made on the third day, it's done with. And, uh, and, and it's representing Yeshua, just a beautiful representative of Yeshua. And, and, and this was uh, for intentional sin. That's what it was uh, covering here. And this note here, well, we'll get to 22 for that. So, so that's significant. So I'm going to highlight that here, but still not use it for a scripture of the day. We'll wait and we'll see if that's it. Let's continue reading. It's a great chapter. So verse 19, meat that touches anything ceremonially unclean may not be eaten. So if the meat just touched anything, it was unclean. Now, uh, there, there are all these laws and regulations about uh, touching things and cleaning hands and washing things, being clean and unclean. Don't get this misunderstood. Unclean does not mean unsaved or, 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 or we no longer have an opportunity. But, but part of obedience meant you, you wanted to be clean and Today, I would suggest that we're all unclean because the way to be redeemed or, or clean, cleansed was you had to go to a temple service or do something. So we're all unclean from a certain standpoint today, uh, but we could certainly be saved through the blood of Yeshua Messiah who washes our sins away. But uh, if an unclean person bumps into us, guess what? We're considered unclean. We hear the words unclean and we think of something in, in a negative light because it's not clean, uh, but it's, it's not necessary a negative light as much as it is a stereotype you are unclean because you did something so you could be a, a, a we're all sinners but you could sin and become unclean because of your sin but you could not sin and still be unclean because of somebody else's sin you know because we could have touched somebody else or bumped in somebody else 
Here's what it comes down to for folks. And this is an important lesson and thing to understand. Sin is contagious. And, and we don't fear Yahweh and fear sin today. And this is why we have a problem. And this is why we don't give reverence to Yeshua, uh, to what we should. I mean, years ago, there was something called the Ebola virus, which is still out there. But I mean, if somebody was walking down the street and you heard they had Ebola, you were running the other way. You weren't stopping to talk to them. Why? Because you feared getting this. Well, when you understand that sin is contagious and you hear a sin is walking down the street, you should not stop to talk to him. You should treat it the same way and run to get away. Because certainly by associating with that unclean or, or that sinner, uh, it is contagious. And what he's particularly doing uh, can easily rub off on you because all our hearts are the same and we're all wicked sinners. Uh, well, we're all sinners. We're not necessarily all wicked, uh, but we're all sinners. And we have to be cleansed only by the blood of Messiah and stay away and avoid other sinners. That's what we need to be doing. Somebody might say, but Yeshua ate with sinners. And uh, so why can't we? Well, I'm all for evangelism and I'm all for getting the word out there and helping other people. Uh, but I'm not for just fellowshipping and hanging out with sinners uh, as they are common, uh, common, ordinary brothers and sisters. Uh, we definitely need to go up there and go in prayer. And see, we need to fear sin and go with reverence uh, to our creator and the blood of Yeshua and not just treat it as a casual thing. Uh, we fear sickness and disease so much so you know, we're willing to cut off a body part, literally cut off a body part. Uh, so we won't physically uh, let a disease spread in our body. Uh, but when it comes to cutting off our body parts, so sin wouldn't spread in our body. People say, well, we can't take that literally. That's just the scriptures. No, it's exactly what the scriptures are. And if one part of your body is going to cause you to sin, uh, you need to work it out or cut it out one way or the other. Uh, and not fear man's diseases more than the sin of Yahweh. Uh, but we can be made right to the blood of Yeshua Messiah. Hallelujah. So uh, continuing in verse 18 here, it says, meat, oh, 19, verse 19, meat that touches anything ceremonially unclean may not be eaten. It must be completely burned up. The rest of the meat may be eaten, but only by people who are ceremonially clean. If you are ceremonially unclean and you uh, eat meat, from a peace offering that was presented to Yahweh, you will be cut off from the community. If you touch anything that is unclean, whether it is human defilement or an unclean animal or any other unclean detestable thing, and then eat meat from the peace offering uh, presented to Yahweh, you will be cut off from the community. So there's a lot of these rules and instructions here and everything else like this, but I tell you, uh, I'm going to play it safe, and I'm going to build a, a, a gate or a fence around this idea. I, I choose to be a vegetarian and not eat any meat uh, because uh, these meats here were d directly related to uh, to temple service and sacrifice. It really didn't have anything to do with nutrition, but I'll tell you what. There are a lot of cleans that are un -meat, uh, unclean meats out there, and they're not as easy to distinguish the difference between clean and unclean meat today. And I don't want anything unclean touching me if I can help it. And uh, if I don't know it, I'm going to avoid it. Uh, and now we're going to look at the, the forbidding blood and fat. And so many of these offerings are related to blood and fat. And uh, they're not necessarily bad things. They're beautiful things. Uh, the, the fat represents the richness or the goodness of something. And, and the blood represents uh, Yahweh and the life of something. So it says, then Yahweh said to Moses, give the following instructions to the people of Israel. You must never eat fat, whether from the cattle, sheep, or goats. The fat of the animal uh, found dead uh, or torn in pieces by wild animals must never be eaten, though it may be used for other purposes. So roadkill, they're pretty much talking about here, uh, and uh, it's found dead or ripped into pieces. And I would say a lot of the factory farming today, there are animals that die naturally that would fall into this category, but you just can't tell. The only way is to avoid meat altogether, in my opinion. So it says, anyone who eats fat from an animal presented as a special gift to Yahweh will be cut off from the community. No matter where you live, you must never consume the blood of any bird or animal. So any found the air or any animal, you must never consume the blood. The blood belonged to Yahweh. And it even says, thy life is in thy blood. And we could look at it in many ways. The, the health 
of you is determined on clean blood, but we could also look at it in a way that the blood of Yeshua gives us life. Hallelujah. And it says we should, we should not eat the blood. Anyone who consumes the blood will be cut off from the community. Now you notice this isn't a, a deathable or stonable offense. It's being cut off from the community. But during that time, this was just as good as a startable offense because uh, the community was everything. It wasn't like today. And to be cut off from the community, sometimes it was only for a certain amount of time. And sometimes it might have been much longer. But uh, this wasn't a, just a, a thing people wanted to experience because uh, this is a community, remember, where Yahweh was the leader. So you're pretty much uh, being thrown away from being in a community with Yahweh. Uh, and, and, and the people just uh, took this seriously. And, you know, so remember, we have plagues and we have three common uh, outcomes to the plagues that Yahweh put on people. We have disease, we have starvation, and we have death. These are the three common things. And uh, being cut off from the people uh, often could equal to all three of those things. Because if you're cut off from the community, you don't have the food. Uh, you know, you're, you're more susceptible to disease and, and death is uh, the result of those two things. Now we're looking at the portion of the priest. And remember when we think about this, who's Yahweh's priest today? And when we think about the portion that we give them or, or they get, and now think about uh, Yeshua is our sacrifice. And we are priests today that can come directly to him, just like the priest went to Yahweh here on the altar. It says, Then Yahweh said to Moses, Give the following instructions to the people of Israel. When you present a peace offering to Yahweh, bring part of it as a gift to Yahweh, Present it to Yahweh with your own hands as a special gift to Yahweh. Bring the fat of the animal together with the, the, the breast and uh, lift up the breast as a special offering to Yahweh. Then the priest will burn the fat on the altar, but the breast will belong to Aaron and his descendants. Give the right thigh of your peace offering to the priest as a gift. The right thigh must always give the priest who offers the blood and the, fall, uh, and the fat of uh, the peace offering. So it must always be given, it must always be given to him, the right thigh here. So it says part of the offering was this, uh, designated for the priest. The food helped to care for the priest who cared for Yahweh's house. The New Testament teaches that ministers should be paid by the people they serve. Uh, we should give generously to those who ministers. So these are uh, offerings that were made to help support not just Yahweh's order and pattern, but also the Levitical priesthood. Uh, they were made for that for that reason, many of these. So uh, continue along here uh, in verse 34. Well, it also says here, uh, the wave offering is lifted up to the heavens and then moved back and forth between uh, before belonging to the priest. So so it's a wave offering. So you, you have it and you wave the offering on each side before giving it to the priest. And so, verse 33, uh, well, we, the 34, I have reserved the breast of the special offering of the right thigh of the sacred offering for the priest. So you had a set-apart offering for set-apart people in a set-apart way. It is the permanent right of Aaron and his descendants to share the peace offerings brought by the people of Israel to share in the peace offerings. This is a rightful share. A special, uh, the special gifts presented to, uh, to Yahweh have been reserved for Aaron and his descendants from the time they were set apart to serve Yahweh as priests. And uh, verse 36 says here, on, on the day they were anointed, Yahweh commanded the Israelites to give up these portions uh, to give these portions to the priest, their permanent share from generation to generation. And then we have another offering next in verse 37, the uh, orientation offering. It refers to the offering given in a ceremony when priests were uh, inducted into office. And then we're going to get into uh, verse 38, where it says, Yahweh gave his people many rituals and instructions to follow. All the rituals in the Levitical were meant to teach the people valuable lessons. But over time, the people became indifferent to the meaning of these rituals, and they began to lose touch with Yahweh. Uh, so, so it's very sad, but that's what happened. And we're going to 
finish up this chapter here, uh, reading uh, 37 and 38. It says, these are the instructions for the burnt offering, the grain offering, the sin offering, and the guilt offering, as well as the orientation offering and the peace offering. Yahweh gave these instructions to Moses on Mount Sinai when he commanded the Israelites to present the, their offerings to Yahweh in the wilderness. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And I'm going to make this last verse here, the scripture of the day, that these instructions were given on Mount Sinai uh, to, to help them about these offerings, to present these as in the wilderness. Our creator provides. And we're in the wilderness today, somewhere between the slavery of the world and the promised land of Yahweh that's to come. Uh, many people today are stuck in the wilderness, just like they were stuck coming out of the slavery of Egypt, going into the promised land that Yahweh promised them. But he provided along the way for everything we needed to make our offerings and our sacrifice. And what the people decided to do with that was up to them. It says in the book, many are called, but few are chosen. Today I give before you life. Uh, choose life versus death. So hallelujah, hallelujah. So that was Leviticus chapter 7. Tomorrow we're going to be reading Leviticus chapter 8 and continue reading this book that so many people miss, but it's so important because it represents uh, and talks about the priest of our wonderful creator. And we being the priest and with the high priest today being Yeshua Messiah, it's important to know these instructions. All right, everybody. So please pray, pray praise, proclaim, read and repent, and submit. Have a blessed day today. Share this with others. Put your comments and questions below the videos. Until then, everybody. Uh, Shalom, shalom, and, and have a safe day.